Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Joel Schostrom, and I'm the president and CEO of the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano. Thank you for being here for our sixth annual yet second virtual legislative luncheon. I know you're all very busy, and I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to learn about our Food Bank's advocacy work. I'm thrilled to be opening up this year's event, and, but before we jump into all things advocacy, I'd like to share a little about what our Food Bank's response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, wildfires, and food insecurity in Contra Costa and Solano counties. We know this global pandemic has impacted essentially all of us, whether it be through lost jobs, reduced incomes, you know, or illness, um, or even school schedules and remote learning that has impacted so many in our community and, and staff here at our own food bank. For the past 22 months, this virus has brought genuine fear to our staff, clients, and community. And as we sought to understand COVID-19 and how to make our work environment as safe as possible for our staff, our volunteers, our agencies, and our clients, we had to pivot and adapt in essentially all areas of our operations from sanitation, social distancing, remote work for some staff, and most obvious is wearing masks you know, almost everywhere we go. But through these very challenging times, I could not be more proud of our food bank staff, our volunteers, our donors, our partner agencies, our elected officials, and our community as we have collectively really stepped up to meet that rising need in our community and to serve our neighbors in need. With everyone's help, we are now serving about 240,000 people every month in our community. That's roughly 80,000 more people every month than before the pandemic. Unfortunately, as we saw in the last recession, the increased need is predicted to continue for more than just months, but literally years ahead. Serving our neighbors living with food insecurity with nutritious food fills their immediate basic needs, but advocacy is part of the long-term solution in our fight to end hunger. As Cassidy, our policy and advocacy manager will soon mention, advocacy through our collective network has yielded tremendous results in 2021. We are the first state to pass school meals for all. We saw record investments in increased food purchasing. And we continue to appreciate the strong partnerships we have with our elected officials from all over the region, the state, and the nation. I'm very pleased to announce that Assembly Member Cecilia Aguiar Curry, representing California's 4th District, has agreed to speak today. So welcome, Assembly Member Aguiar Curry, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Joel. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. And I want to thank you for all the work you all are doing. Yes, I represent the 4th District, which represents portions of Calusa County, Solano County, Sonoma County, Yolo, uh, as well as Napa and Lake County. So I have quite the big area that we find people that are hungry and the food banks are working with us throughout the state of California. You know, from the advocacy efforts to combat, combat um, food insecurity, to the various community programs you sponsor and feed entire families, college students, and our seniors, you are truly making a difference in people's lives. The pandemic, you know, caused a, lot, a big dramatic uh, shift in our workforce that closed businesses and led to skyrocketing unemployment. Families struggled to pay their bills and feed their children. And for many families, it was the first time ever they'd had to experience food insecurity and financial insecurity. Like many food banks across the district, the Food Bank of Contra Costa County and Solano stepped up to meet this need and make sure families didn't fall through the cracks. So thank you. Thank you for hosting this legislative luncheon. It is a wonderful time for us to come together and reflect on the progress that, that has been made in the anti-hunger movement and to collectively re-energize for the new legislative cycle. Uh, in an effort to eliminate um, hunger and reduce poverty in 2021, I supported several legislative measures that allowed families to put nutritious food on their table and keep more money in their pockets. And as, also as a farmer, I know a little bit about agriculture. Our farmers are incredible stewards of the land so I'm always working to make sure that legislation is looking out for our farmers and our rural communities and supporting programs that will help make farming more efficient and more sustainable. So I'm committed and I will always be committed to continuing our partnership with the food banks and the food bank collectively in Solano and uh, Contra Costa County and to work with, uh, collaboratively with you. 
and I will continue to support and look for legislative solutions to mitigate food insecurity in our communities. Again, thank every single one of you for all your hard work and your partnership. And with that, I'd like to turn the event over to Cassidy Carmen Bates, the Policy and Advocacy Manager at the Food Bank. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Aguilar Curry and Joel for those wonderful reminders about the important role that the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano plays in our community and about the need for food security advocacy. My name is Cassidy Bates and I'm the Public Policy and Advocacy Manager here at the Food Bank. Thank you so much for your time during this incredibly busy holiday season. We are so happy that you could join us today and we appreciate your continued partnership. Whenever we talk about our advocacy work, I always try to reinforce that advocacy is a collective effort. Without the determination and strength of our larger network, I do not think that we would be celebrating as amazing of advocacy wins as we are about to acknowledge. With that being said, I'd like to recognize the elected officials who are here with us today. I'm going to read the names of the elected officials who themselves or their staff are present and then we will transition into the 2021 advocacy wins. From the US Senate, Senator Padilla and Senator Feinstein. From the US House of Representatives, Congressman McNerney, Congressman Garamendi, Congressman Desanye. From the California State Assembly, Assemblymember Aguilar Curry, Assemblymember Wicks, Assemblymember Bauer Cahan. From the California Senate, Senator Dodd, Senator Skinner, Senator Glazer. Contra Costa County Supervisors, Mitchoff and Glover. Solano County Supervisor, Sparing. Mayor Martinez Rubin from the city of Pinal. Mayor Schroeder of Martinez. Mayor Harris of Pleasant Hill. Mayor Candell of Lafayette and Mayor Higgins of Oakley. Despite all of the challenges that the COVID-19 pandemic has continued to present us all with, we have observed a renewed focus on the importance of ending hunger. 2021 has been a year where tremendous progress has been made in the anti-hunger movement. Here in California, we have the distinct honor to be able to say that we are the very first state in the country to pass and sign into law school meals for all. Our very own Senator Nancy Skinner authored this bill and our collective advocacy network rallied to ensure the passage of this new legislation. This will be implemented during the 2022-2023 school year. School Meals for All allows all California students in K through 12 public schools to receive breakfast and lunch at no cost to the family, regardless of income or immigration status. The research tells us that when students are well-nourished, they are able to focus and succeed in school. And when our students are able to succeed, they're more likely to be engaged in committing and investing in their own futures. This is an investment in our students today, but really an investment in our state and nation's future. In 2021, we also saw record funding come towards the California Food Bank Network. And once again, our collective advocacy was successful in raising awareness around the importance of this funding and how food banks will utilize these funds to continue to meet the increased need that we are all serving in light of the pandemic. As Joel mentioned earlier, the increased need that we began serving at the start of COVID is really our new baseline, and we anticipate to be serving this increased need for years to come. Once again, one of our very own elected officials, Assemblymember Buffy Wicks, co-authored the $110 million budget investment for emergency food purchasing that was passed and signed into law. And additionally, the $182 million investment in food bank resilience and climate capacity to ensure food banks remain open and operational during disasters was passed in 2021. At the national level, we have been so appreciative for the continued partnership with our congressional leaders and senators and the investments in the ongoing pandemic EBT program. And on the regional level, we continue to be so impressed for the engagement and commitment with our city and county leaders who are truly amazing partners as we continue to navigate hunger in our communities. 
This has taken the form of identifying if and where new food distributions can take place, hearing directly from our counties what they need in order to create a more client-centered experience, and collectively identifying the root causes of hunger in our community so we can all continue to work together to find solutions to hunger in Contra Costa and Solano counties. To put it another way, for those of you who may be better at math than I am, we achieved approximately an 85% success rate with our food bank policy agenda this year. Out of the 13 bills that we centered our focus on throughout 2021, 11 of them were signed into law and a 12th one may be reintroduced in the next legislative cycle. The 2021 legislative cycle on the local, state, and federal levels has been a historic year for food security legislation. Whether we look at the record levels of funding that has come towards our network, the adoption of the universal school meals here in California, the progress made on the national level regarding child nutrition and various food security topics, the increased partnership with our regional partners, and the incredible strength and power in our advocacy coalition. As Bob, our legislative advocacy associate will detail soon, our advocacy work is only possible due to the community advocates from our service area that partner with us throughout the entire legislative process. Without these strong and unique individuals who share with us their lived experience of hunger and passion for food security, we truly would not be doing thoughtful and comprehensive policy work as we place such high priority on centering lived experience and improving food systems for those they are intended to serve. I additionally want to address two of our advocacy partners who make so much of what we do possible, and that is the California Association of Food Banks and Feeding America. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Senator Steve Glazer, who represents the 7th District of California. Senator Glazer has been a longtime supporter of our mission here at the Food Bank of Contra Costa and Solano. One of our flagship advocacy programs, the Speaker Series, occurs each year between March and May, and Senator Glazer joined us at the Speaker Series graduation earlier this year at probably one of the busiest times for California lawmakers as the state budget was being revised. But nonetheless, Senator Glazer joined our team and listened to each and every one of our advocates as they presented their hunger story, a two minute speech that they had prepared over the course of six weeks, detailing their passion for advocacy. The overwhelming response from our advocates was that Senator Glazer made them feel confident as they shared their stories publicly and that they appreciated that he responded to each advocate individually. Senator Glazer planned to join us live today, but late last night was called into work with the governor at a press conference. He is disappointed to not be with us today, but he has been kind enough to record his message to us this morning. Senator, thank you for recognizing the work of the food bank and of our advocates. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our pre-recorded message from Senator Steve Glazer. Thank you, Kasadi, for that, that wonderful introduction. I so enjoyed uh, being a part of the, of the graduation ceremony for the speaker series because I got to hear the uh, powerful stories of those who, who are advocating uh, for the work of the food bank. And uh, they were particularly meaningful when they, they brought to life their own experiences, uh, whether it was uh, knowing someone who was uh, in crisis or homeless, or they, they themselves having difficult times uh, in their life. You know, the, uh, the roads and alleyways of our community don't look like the pristine halls of your local hospital, but behind so many doors and tent flaps and car doors and in doorways are people that are in crises no different than if they were in the hospital uh, ICU. And I think of those involved, all of you involved in the food bank work as our community nurses. You are there to help people at the most difficult time in their life. And uh, for many of you who have engaged with those in crises, and I have as well, you learn that they're not strangers, they're folks from your community who have fallen on hard times. 
uh, fathers, mothers, grandparents, uh, young people. And um, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a powerful message that all of us, even in comfortable surroundings, that a health crisis, a rent increase, um, a, a, a job loss could make us incredibly vulnerable as well. And so all of you make up the safety net that keeps us together and helps those in need in such important and powerful ways. So I, I wanna say thank you. Joel, uh, you and your team have done incredible work this year under such difficult circumstances. Thank you. Uh, your board chair, Laura Moran, and your volunteers that provide the policy direction for the food bank, uh, thank you. Uh, to all those who are drivers or volunteers, uh, you are our community nurses. Uh, you help in so many important and impactful ways. I know all of us hope that the year ahead is going to be better from what we've just experienced, but we still have some rocky times ahead. But I know that they're made better because of the energetic and, and important work uh, of the food bank. I am your partner in that effort, and I look forward to that continuing partnership uh, next year and beyond because we have so many people to care for as our community nurses. So thank you and I wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you, Senator Glazer. Uh, my name is Laura Moran. This is my sixth year on the board of directors at the Food Bank and my second year as chair of the board. And it's really been my privilege to serve. This year, I had the pleasure of working with the speaker series. I was asked to teach a module on helping our advocates develop their, their own personal stories and understand how very powerful they can be. You know, when you, when you tell your story, you're sharing something about yourself that helps you connect with others. Um, but I think as many of us know, sharing your personal story can be hard. It can make you feel insecure. And it's truly an act of vulnerability, one that requires allowing yourself to be seen by others. And when you do that, you see that your story is not your weakness, it's actually your strength and it has the power to change perceptions. In working with our advocates, I was truly moved, um, not only by the lived experience that they have had related to food insecurity, but even more so by their courage in sharing these stories and, then, and letting themselves be vulnerable. In fact, I was so impressed with these individuals and their commitment to fighting hunger that I stayed on and participated as a coach through the rest of the program. And I'm really, really proud of each and every one of them. Three of these impressive advocates are here today on our panel. The first is Kiva Dean. Kiva has been very involved in numerous Bay Area ministries and community organizations. She's worked as a social worker, a family development worker, an advocate, and a fundraiser. Our second is Jenny Burton. Jenny is a nurse at St. Mary's College and a community health advocate. Uh, you'll see she's a hunger, a hunger fighter who believes that all college students should have healthy meals to help them succeed. And last but not least is Christina Loyola Cabral. Tina is the dining room manager for Loaves and Fishes in Antioch. And she's been involved with our food bank for the past three years after graduating from the 2018 speaker series. And you'll see she gets great joy from knowing that she can make a difference in the lives of others. So it's a really great group of people that we have on this panel today. And with that, I will hand it over to Bob Rilling Smith. He is the Legislative Advocacy Associate at our Food Bank. He's also the moderator for the Community Advocate Panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Good morning, everyone. As Laura mentioned, I'm Bob Rilling Smith, the Food Bank's Legislative Advocacy Associate. I'm excited to turn towards the panel discussion portion of our event. Today, we have three fantastic community advocates from our speaker series and community advocacy partnership programs. These two programs really represent the backbone of our ad advocacy efforts here at the Food Bank and inform so much of what we do. Today, we are grateful to have Jenny, Kiva, and Tina. Let's meet our guests. Jenny, if you could briefly introduce yourself and describe your experience with hunger. Thanks, Bob. My name is Jenny Burton, and I am a nurse at St. Mary's College, where COVID testing, care, and vaccination of students has been my priority during the current pandemic. I'm a 2021 Food Bank Speaker Series graduate, and I'm a college hunger fighter. 
That's great, Jenny. Thanks so much for joining us today and for raising awareness for an issue that so many don't even realize exists, college hunger. And Kiva, please tell our audience a little bit about yourself and a little about your lived experience as well. Hi, thank you, Bob. My name is Kiva Dean, and I'm a resident and employee of Contra Costa County. 25 years ago, I received CalWORKs, Medi-Cal, food stamps, WIC, and Section 8. And today I'm a supervisor in the same building where I received some of those benefits. Though in my life from childhood, I have lived a life of service and volunteerism. Since I've graduated from the Contra Costa Solano County Food Bank series, a speaker series, I've delved more into advocacy because I believe my voice can be the voice of many. Thanks, Kiva. And thanks so much for not only being with us today, but for being such a powerful community advocate. And last but certainly not least, Tina, please introduce yourself and tell us just a little bit about your background with hunger. Okay, I think we have a, a connection problem with Tina, so we're just gonna just gonna um, keep moving. Uh, so turning towards the question portion of our panel, uh, Jenny, the first question goes to you. How would you say the food bank's advocacy training has made you a more effective advocate? Um, thank you, Bob. I participated in the food bank speaker series with my daughter, who's a high school senior. During this program, our hunger fighting truly rose to a higher level. Not only were we delivering meals to homeless encampments in Oakland, California, but we learned how hunger legislation funds change. We were not just serving lunches at Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco, but we learned that our elected officials, including the Honorable Senator Glazer and Senator Dodd are real people who really want to hear our stories. During the speaker series, as Laura mentioned, we crafted a personal hunger story, which required me to think about exactly why fighting hunger is important to me. I was educated about our state's legislative process and I am honored to be a voice that Cassidy Bates and Bob Rilling Smith, our food bank's public policy, team listen to as they create the food bank's legislative priorities for 2022. As a hunger fighter, I spoke to students at my college about food insecurity. Sadly, they did not know that CalFresh support was available to them. One student estimates that four in 10 of her friends skip meals regularly due to short funds. However, this student has gone on to obtain CalFresh benefits for the first time in her life as a doctoral student at a California public university. She is now awarded $200 monthly for food, which helps her tremendously. As a food bank community advocacy partner, I proposed we begin food insecurity screening in the wellness division at my college. So this includes in the urgent care clinic, in the counseling department, at the Campus Assault Center and in our Student Disability Center. Beginning in 2022, any student who screens positive for food insecurity in these departments will be directed to the campus food pantry and to a CalFresh application. Hunger is a beast. Our hunger advocacy must translate to the change our world needs. So please consider how you can embrace just one more hunger fighter like me in your leadership circle. Great, Jenny, thanks so much. We're so lucky to have you as a partner with us and so proud of all the work that you do. It really is impressive. I know as a former college student myself, college hunger is one of those aspects of hunger that often goes overlooked. And there's kind of this misperception that college students shouldn't, that should be hungry or have a poor diet, but the consequences of that misperception really are vast. All right, Tina, turning to you, we lost you for a second, but what you, we got you back now, so. <laughs> <Internet>. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry about it. So if, if you just want to uh, introduce yourself to the audience briefly, maybe talk a little bit about your hunger experience, that would be great. Um, I'm Christina Loyola Cabral. I'm the dining room manager for Loaves and Fishes of Contra Costa County in Antioch. Um, I am a graduate of the speaker series. I've been on in the speaker series for about three years, and the last two years I've been a peer mentor. Perfect, Tina. Thank you so much. And we're really grateful to have your experience with us here today. Thank you. All right. Kina, or Kiva, excuse me, turning to you, how would you say you've applied your advocacy skills in practice? 
Thank you, Bob. I've had several opportunities to apply my, to apply my skills. Immediately upon graduation, I presented my hunger story during the Hunger Week to advocate for Senate and Assembly bills addressing hunger for children in primary and secondary schools. I also had the opportunity to present as a Contra Costa resident alongside the food bank to a county advisory board where we advocated for increased partnership to provide medically tailored meals for food bank rep, uh, recipients. And I found that that's one of my passions. I uh, was also asked to submit a 30 second video of my hunger story to the lawmakers in Washington, DC. When the Contra Costa Solano Food Bank met with two congressmen, I had the privilege of participating as a person with lived experience. And the focus of that meeting was wildfires, COVID-19, as well as hunger uh, in general. I was also given the honor of representing the, the uh, Contra Costa Solano Food Bank in the two-year CAP program, Collaborative Advocacy and Power Project. This is a program where I'm learning the intricate and in-depth details of advocacy from requirements to become a nonprofit to lobbying to leadership skills. And I'm really learning a lot in that program. I have been interviewed um, with a research student with a focus on domestic violence and hunger, which I personally also have experience in. And I was included in that published article as well. The skills I've, uh, that I have learned have helped me to work better with the CBOs, um, such as uh, the Contra Costa Continuum of Care Council on Homelessness and other CBOs that I work with, as well as working with my clients on my job. I hope that by attending this forum, you will be inspired to continue your work to end and fight hunger in Contra Costa County and farther. Kiva, thank you so much for sharing. You really are a leader in terms of advocacy here in our community. The sheer volume of your advocacy work that you are taking on is so impressive. Our community is so lucky to have your voice at the table. Thank you, Bob. Now, I know you are passionate about hunger and individuals experiencing homelessness. Please tell us a little bit more about that. Um, well, people say practice makes perfect. Oh. No, sorry, I, I, Tina, I was turning to you. I'm sorry about that, Kiva, my mistake. So uh, Tina, if you just wanna explain a little bit about your passion of uh, hunger with individuals experiencing homelessness, that would be great. All right. Um, well, I, as, I, as you know, I work in, um, for Loaves and Fishes of Contra Costa and on a daily basis, I see how hunger affects people. We have um, one gentleman that would come in and he would um, just shovel food in his mouth just before he even sat down with his tray, he would just start shoveling the food. And he would eat up to four to five trays of food at one setting, which is mind boggling. And then he would go like days, you know, like if it's on a Friday, then he would go until Monday without eating. And then the same thing, it would be like just shoveling food in his mouth. Um, also, um, I've seen instances where um, I was incarcerated in West County and there was a woman who was homeless. And while she was in West County, she was able to eat and um, she was warm. And when it came time for her release, she didn't want to go. They actually had to drag this woman out kicking and screaming because she had nowhere to go and no food. Two days later, she was back. She got busted for um, stealing food at the store. And I advocated for a um, year and a half ago for a bill that would allow people, as you're getting out of incarceration, to have a card. That way you're not deal you know recidivism at its finest and um i had talked to a friend about it and she said you know tina it's easier to find someone to get you high than it is to to find someone to feed you a meal and i just thought that was that's terrible it shouldn't be like that that bill was passed by the way so people when they get out of jail now they are um, given a snap benefits card which is cool Thanks, Tina. It's great that people like yourself take such an effort to address such a vulnerable segment of our population, the formerly incarcerated. By doing so, not only helps people directly, but to your point, also contributes to the safety of our community. And then I just wanted to ask one more question on that, Tina, uh, with working with vulnerable groups. 
Uh, I know you're passionate about uh, individuals experiencing homelessness. I remember you remember you telling me a story about how uh, you took on a project to provide can openers uh, for some of your your clients. I just wondered yes. if you want to take a few minutes to talk about that. I'm yes. sure the audience would really love, love to hear that story. Um, Loaves and Fishes does can drive, uh, you know, food drives. And I noticed while we were packing up the people's bags that um, they have all these cans of food, but there's no pop tops. And I was thinking, well, how are these people going to open these cans? They don't have any can openers. And, you know, people think, you know, a pop top, that's a convenience. But when you're homeless, that's like a necessity or a can opener. So I contacted some of my friends and we uh, raised $116. And I went to the um, to the Dollar Tree and I actually I went to quite a few of them and I wiped them out of their can openers. <laughs> so I was able to hand out 116 can openers to our clients so they could open their cans and eat food. <laughs> That's great, bad. Tina. Thanks so much for sharing that. 116 can openers is, you know, uh, 116 differences in a lot of people's lives. So that's great. Thank you so much for you. not only your work again with individuals experiencing homelessness, but with the formerly incarcerated. You're, you're really on the front lines doing a lot of great work and we're very grateful to have your voice. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Now, Jenny, turning to you, uh, as you've kind of alluded to earlier, one area that you're very passionate about is college hunger. If you'd like to talk a little bit more about that, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, I am passionate about college hunger. And I have learned that college students who lack consistent access to enough food are 43% less likely to graduate than their food secure peers. So I'm working to increase student awareness around SNAP benefits at my college because only one in five food insecure students seek SNAP benefits. So we need to close the SNAP gap. Linking students to a SNAP application and supporting them with food until their SNAP benefits begin are both important to me. So food insecure students are more likely to suffer from depression and anxiety. So they may not be able to cope with the challenges college brings them. Hunger affects the student's immunity. This is important to address because college students live in a congregate setting <clears throat> where illnesses like COVID-19, flu, strep throat, and mono are an ongoing community challenge. Maintaining healthy communities is of utmost importance during the current COVID-19 pandemic. Hunger lastly affects the student ability to, to focus in the classroom, which affects their academic performance. College students are the future and they deserve healthy food so they can reach their potential. Thanks, Jenny. The stats you list are staggering. 43% less likely to graduate and only one in five seek benefits that they're eligible for like CalFresh. The work you're doing, just raising awareness is so important. People aren't aware of the problem and that there are resources to address it will never improve. But thanks to you, it is improving. Thanks so much for being on the front lines of college hunger and making a real difference right here in our community. Welcome. All right, Kiva, I'll pose the same question to you. What's, a, what's some of the, the passions that you have around food insecurity? Well, like I said earlier, uh, Bob, my pa I learned during this process that one of my passions is food as medicine. People say practice makes perfect or practice makes improvement. I say practice makes habit. What happens is um, when, uh, when we grow up eating the wrong foods or eating unhealthy foods, we develop unhealthy eating habits. And we also, we, we know that there's a higher incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes. These are nutrition-based um, conditions in poor communities. And why is that? Because we know that pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic, nutritious food tended to be a, a, of a higher cost, right? And so we, as, as the pandemic has progressed, we know that the groceries in general are, are much um, higher. I remember when I was a kid, my mom, I'm number eight of nine children, and my mom had to, to feed nine children and we were on welfare. So she bought 50 pound bags of rice and potatoes and beans and flour and sugar because yes, there is some, um, there is something to be said for shelf uh, shelf safe food, right? However, it was very difficult to feed us healthy 
vegetables and fruit the fruits because it was expensive. And so we developed the habit of eating those types of foods, which can translate into unhealthy health outcomes. Well, I think that um, in, in my opinion, and I think studies have shown that when you're when you eat healthier foods, you have healthier outcomes. So medically, um, med medical meals or medically tailored meals are great. And I think that what we need to do is continue to give our children, uh, all children, and especially those in economically disadvantaged areas, um, the opportunity to have healthy uh, mental acuity, healthy physical bodies by providing them with fruits, greens, vegetables, and fruits and healthy foods so that they're just, these families are not just, uh, don't just have the access to those shelf safe foods, right? Um, and so I'm really, really happy to be able to say that that's one of my passions. Um, I think that when we uh, give people the opportunity to eat the right things, we will ultimately develop healthy outcomes, which will, at bottom line, not be such a big burden on our health system as well. And we can also remember, not just about children, but they always say you can't change horses in the middle of the stream. That's not true. It only takes 28 days to develop a habit, right? And practice makes habit. So even unhealthy adults or even adults who are eating un in an unhealthy way can develop a habit of eating in a more healthy way. And those people who are in our community who are economically disadvantaged need assistance with that. Thank you, Kiva, that's great. Yeah, the intersection you address between nutrition and health is so important. And something like 80% of chronic disease are di diet and nutrition related. That's why we here at the Food Bank not only wanna make sure people have enough food, but also that they have the right food that directly addresses the points you mentioned like diet and nutrition. That's why we're also happy to support Universal School Meals for Children that has the oppor opportunity to introduce a lot of healthy, nutritious food. So to your point, practice really can become habit for the next generation. And we're also happy to support also, as you mentioned, food is medicine, which directly targets that intersection between diet and overall health. Thanks again, Kiva. You're welcome. All right, that's great, everyone. The Food Bank is really lucky to have such passionate, dedicated advocates working on the many aspects of hunger affecting our community. As our advoc advocacy team here is just two people, we really couldn't address the many faces of hunger without all of your input. Thank you. All right, turning to a, to a new topic. How has advocating for the food bank shaped you? This could either be as a person in your career or any aspect of your life. Tina, I'll pose this question to you first. How has it shaped me? Let me think. In many ways, <laughs> um, I've, I think it's given me more confidence. And it's made me realize that my my voice is powerful and that that I can make change. Um, just a lot more confidence, I think. That's great. And more yeah. empathy oh. too. Oh. Sorry. More <laughs> empathy. Because I get to see like the big picture now, not just like my homeless people, but I get to see students going hungry, little kid, well, I was a little kid growing up hungry too, but um, you know, the, the big picture of hunger and, and what it does, and it's not a good thing. Food is a human right. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and I, I have, I've had the same experience too, just in terms of noticing those different aspects of hunger, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. they really are, that by working with all of us together, you really do develop empathy for, you know, all the people do, who are experiencing hunger. It's great, Tina. Yeah. Jenny, I'll pose the same question to you. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, Bob, like Tina, the opportunities I have had as a volunteer advocate have really given me confidence. I need to continue forward with my advocacy journey as well. I never imagined I would sit face to face with an elected official sharing my personal experiences and making a legislative ask. I feel so empowered to be part of the hunger solution and I have grown professionally tremendously in this program. So I truly believe that all professionals can advocate for food security in their circles. 
Thank you, Jenny. That, that's great. Uh, and then Kiva, lastly to you. I agree with uh, both Jenny and Tina that has given me confidence um, and courage because again, like Jenny, Jenny said, I never thought I'd be sitting across the table from legislators advocating. Um, I, I never thought that uh, what I had to say was any of any worth. And what I've learned, um, please forgive me, what I've learned during this process is that my voice is the voice of many. And if I open my mouth, I can make a difference for people uh, who've had similar experiences for me. And that's what, again, because of my childhood and my life, that's what I've always wanted to do, serve, and volunteer. And so I'm making the advocacy part of it is making a big difference, not just in my life, but in the lives of those who are touched by what I have to say. Thanks, Kiva. And, and thanks to all, to all three of you for all of the advocacy work that you do. It, it really, again, not to, to belabor the point, but it really does uh, allow us to do all the things that we do on the advocacy effort. And we're glad that you've been able to uh, take some of the, the advocacy, advocacy skills and apply it in your own lives too. That's, that's fantastic. All right, that's all the time we had for today's panel. I thank everyone so much for joining us today. You were excellent. And again, I just wanna extend the food bank's heartfelt appreciation for taking time out of your busy lives to help your community and share your experiences today. Now we'll move on to discussing our legislative priorities for next year. Cassidy detailed earlier, we are so pleased with how well our 2021 legislative priorities fared over the past year and how many became a reality. We are also excited to share our new upcoming legislative priorities for the next year. This represents the areas that our food bank's advocacy team will be focused on and involved within the next year. This list is not meant to be static or etched in stone, but rather dynamic as we will continue to maintain flexibility to new challenges that arise over time. It's best to think of our legislative priorities list as a roadmap of where we would like to go in 2022. Before we dive in, I'd like to take a few seconds to talk about how our legislative priorities are developed. First, we always begin with the review of the previous year to see what went well, what went less well, and to evaluate the change in the legislative landscape. Then we begin a long process of talking with our stakeholders from our community people like our community advocates, three of whom you just met, Jenny, Kiva, and Tina, to get an understanding of what is going on in the community. We also consult with elected officials and their staff to see how things are looking from their perspective and to identify areas where we can partner together. Further, we also talk with food bank staff, food bank leadership, and our board of directors. This process involving many different voices allows our small advocacy team to develop a robust slate of legislative priorities that is both informed by our diverse community members and therefore truly representative of our community and service area. Now let's get to our legislative priorities. We break down our legislative priori priorities into three broad buckets. The first, food bank and food systems resilience, another being bolstering food assistance resources, and lastly, the category of nutritious and healthy foods. Our first category, food bank and food systems resilience, this category covers measures, policies, and funding to ensure food banks have the adequate resources to respond to disasters like our ongoing pandemic, our increasingly severe wildfire season, and our worsening drought crisis. We were not able to respond to the pandemic and wildfires alone, and we are grateful for the help we received to be able to serve our community in multiple crises. Some examples of needed areas are making sure food banks have backup generators, an extra refrigeration space so as to be flexible to expand in a crisis. This category also includes advocating for policies that address climate capacity issues that cause stress on the food supply chain directly. As we've seen with our ongoing water shortages, many acres of farmland are being fallowed because there just isn't enough water to go around. The next subject area we are focused on, bolstering food assistance resources, covers policies, measures, and funding areas we advocate for every single year. As you can see here, and probably know from your own experience, there are a lot of vital programs that make up food assistance. And our collective goal for all these programs is to make sure these measures are adequately funded, able to be accessed by those who are the intended beneficiaries, and also at the same time, 
able to respond to new challenges. And as we've seen, this ability to respond to the changing face of hunger during the pandemic has been critical. Programs like SNAP or CalFresh here in California have been a lifeline to so many, providing an increase in benefits during the pandemic with the average beneficiary now receiving twice as much from the pandemic to over $200 a month. That makes a big difference in so many lives. Pandemic EBT has also been a big help to those in need. We will continue to advocate to ensure it's available to those who need it. One program we're so excited about, as Cassidy mentioned, California has become the first state in the nation to pass universal school meals. Here, we will continue to push and advocate that the program is adequately resourced so that all children are able to access healthy and nutritious food so as to maximize the potential of this groundbreaking program. For example, many schools do not have the proper kitchen equipment to prepare healthy meals and are forced to serve costly prepared food that is often less nutritious. To detail the complexity of this, this is not just an issue for economically challenged school districts, but also within districts where one K through five school may have adequate kitchen equipment, but the middle school in the same district does not. And of course, we will also be focusing on reauthorization of child nutrition, the farm bill, and the much needed nutrition provisions in the Build Back Better Act. Our last area of focus for our legislative priorities, nutritious and healthy foods, we are also very excited about. We are laser focused on raising awareness of the benefits of food as medicine through our own food bank operations and assistance programs like CalFresh and Medi-Cal. This concept has the potential to leverage public dollars in a big way to improve the health of a lot of people. In a sense, food as medicine breaks down the, the traditional silos that separate food security and health and well-being and looks at them together. So on behalf of the Food Bank, thank you for taking the time to virtually be with us here today. Let's open it up for questions. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Ilana. I'm in the background here and I'm going to be um, distributing some uh, questions out to our um, Food Bank staff. Um, we've been receiving some questions um, through the question and answer, through the chat, and um, privately. So we will uh, get to as many as we possibly can. Um, but I did want to let everybody know that uh, we will be sending out the information to reach out to um, the community advocates. So if you have any questions um, specifically for um, Jenny, Kiva, or Tina, um, you will be able to speak with them um, separately. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. And um, I'm going to get started with the first question here, um, which is, uh, how has COVID changed food bank operations? I can take uh, at least part of that in that, um, as we said earlier, you know, the significant increase in need in our community has really forced our food bank, our partners, um, agencies to, to really pivot to overuse the term and scale up. And so we were able to do that successfully over the last 18 months um, through a number of avenues. One is that we um, provided the supplemental food emergency food boxes that you know were a, a quick way for us to scale up and get a lot more food out into the community to those 80,000 to 100,000 more people every month. And our volunteers helped us box about 10,000 of those every single week, and we were able to get those out. We were able to get the National Guard actually to come with us, and I, I met a couple of the guardsmen yesterday who are still with us, but 18 months later, we had 20 to 25 National Guardsmen at the, at the beginning. Um, we're down to two or three right now, but they have been such a blessing in helping us scale up to what we needed to do. Some of the drive-through distributions that you saw, so we didn't necessarily make that up, but jumped on and found that an incredible way for us to ramp up and safely distribute a lot more food to a lot more people. And the need is not dropping as we um, just about six or eight weeks ago set a new drive through record in Solano Middle School with 303 cars served in one hour. So on the one side, I was very proud of the efficiency and getting not just supplemental food, but dairy and produce out into those distributions. Um, but uh, the need is still strong. So we've had to pivot in a lot of ways. And I've just, again, continue to be so pleased with our, our volunteers, our donors, um, our elected officials and helping us do that. 
Thanks, Joel. Um, there's a follow up question here um, that's asking how much food does the food bank distribute? I'll go again, um, but anybody can chime on here just because we, we did serve over 43 million pounds of food last year in our community and that's up from 25 million pounds, you know, just a couple of years ago. So it's a significant amount, but I also want to add that, you know, it's not just about more food. It's about even better food. You know, I think there was a lot of discussion here about, um, you know, we're really committed to meeting that increased need, but with more and better nutritious food. Kiva, think, uh, I think, said it really well, is that, you know, it's, it's really, we need to have those nutritious food. And sometimes it's the produce and the dairy and the proteins that are the most expensive. So we're really committed to expanding not just the amount of food, but the quality of the food and the nutritional value focus and food is medicine um, on increasing produce, dairy, and proteins in our distributions. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have a question here about um, what legislation is the food bank supporting on a national level? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll start with that. And then Bob, if you have anything to add, um, as Bob mentioned in 2022, we're really interested in continuing a lot of what um, us and our network really aim to uh, work on this year. So whether that's through the Build Back Better um, or the different you know, COVID stimulus packages we've seen, we really have a focus on child nutrition. There are talks of, you know, similar to what we've done here in California with school meals for all, there's legislation on the federal level to make that program established nationwide. Um, we also want to be proactive, as proactive as we can be in different uh, food security and agricultural topics to make sure that we are really able to continue serving um, our community when there are things like drought and wildfire and COVID. So looking at all of those legislative and funding opportunities. Um, Bob, anything I missed? Yeah, I, I guess I would just uh, echo much of what you said. And then also to piggyback on, on what Joel was just speaking about, of how the need is still there and how in the last few months, there's been uh, a lot of provisions that have helped a lot of our neighbors in need been pulled out of the system, which is causing a lot of the need still to either maintain this, this not good high level or actually increase. So we'll also be advocating for uh, a lot of policies that hopefully will start to beat back that these elevated numbers that we're seeing every day at our, at our distributions. Absolutely. And, and that reminds me for, there's probably many of you on the call who are familiar with this, but during COVID, we've actually seen the benefit amount of programs like CalFresh, known as SNAP nationwide, um, be increased to record high levels. But what we've seen when that's happened is that clients are saying they've been able to adequately purchase enough food for them and their families, um, and even nutritious food. And that's the truly the goal. And the, um, of those programs. So we've been really fortunate to see the rollout of Pandemic EBT, which was a program rolled out for students, children, um, and these higher benefit amounts. So we will see how those continue as we you know, move into this next year of COVID. Thank you. Yeah, and I think with like, um, I was just listening to the news this morning and they're talking about how the um, child tax credit in January might expire. So a lot of these things we think are actually team and our advocates as a whole have to keep talking because these aren't forever uh, solutions and we need some of them to be forever solutions. Yeah, thank, thank you, Kim, you. for mentioning that too on the child tax credit as it will, at least for the month of January, be suspended. So it's that's going to be an immediate uh, reduction in a lot of our, of our neighbors in need and, and the, the funds and resources that they have. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> In addition to children, um, we also have a question here in the chat regarding um, what the food bank is doing to support uh, senior focused legislation. That's a great question. Um, Bob, do you want to start or do you want me to take this one? Uh, if you want to jump in on all. Yeah. Go. So I think that. Um, I think you're right. I saw in the chat, you know, seniors are a very, how is it worded? Um, a fast growing segment of the population. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, in all of the different populations and demographics that we support in our legislative agenda, 
we really want to look at how different populations are being disproportionately impacted because it, there is not one size fits all when it comes to a solution or an approach to fight food food insecurity with the population. Um, with seniors specifically, we know that they're more vulnerable when it comes to COVID. So the food bank has done things from an operational standpoint, like drive-through distributions, which might have made many seniors in the community feel safer, uh, leaving you know, home to not have any contact whatsoever. When they come to get food, they're able to just open their trunk and a food bank volunteer or staff member puts that food box directly into their car. Um, specifically on the legislative front, like Bob said, we are looking at in the new year, some very exciting pilot programs that would look at sort of a union between Medi-Cal and CalFresh. So seeing if individuals who are on those different state insurance programs are able to receive and purchase healthier food uh, that might be medically tailored through participation in that program as well. Yeah, just to add one last thing uh, and to echo what you just said again, Cassidy, food as medicine has the, the chance to really, uh, to, to your point, Cassidy, each program doesn't necessarily just impact one segment of the population, but food is medicine that really has the opportunity to really benefit our, uh, our elderly community specifically. And I will mention just, um, I think that'll be our last question, but I will mention on that topic, we have, like I've mentioned, an amazing advocacy coalition and network, and there are many members of our network who are very uh, engaged in SSI and other statewide movements that really help lift our seniors. They really want to make a point of, you know, recognizing that many of our seniors are on a very fixed income. We are in one of the most expensive regions of the country, and that seniors who are on those fixed incomes, whether it be uh, supplemental income, whether it be CalFresh, that we are taking care of them and understanding uh, their day-to-day -day needs. So if the food bank can help seniors make each month a little easier, that's a goal that we have. All right, with that, I think that will be our last question. I wanna thank everyone so much for taking the time to be here. We know the holidays are always busy. Thank you so very much. If you have any remaining questions, we will be sending out a follow-up email with all of the contact information um, for all of our speakers today. And it will also include a recording of today's event. Thank you so much and happy holidays.